Most people have heard of human papillomavirus, or HPV, but there are a lot of misconceptions about it. For starters, HPV is more than a single virus. There are actually about 40 types of genital HPV. As a group, HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States, according to Dr. Rodney Willoughby, professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin and a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases. HPV is a virus which is very present in humans and is currently um, epidemic, really, in most of the world. It tends to infect skin cells and other surface cells of the body. HPV is incredibly common. So common, in fact, that some people say anybody who's had sex has probably had HPV. It's probably an overstatement, but the thought is is that roughly half of people who are sexually reproducing uh, have uh, had an HPV infection or have one currently. It's something that is typically transmitted sexually, but affects the majority of the population. So it's not one of those things that, oh, it's only those folks. At some point, most adult men and women will have an HPV infection in their lifetime. That's Dr. Susan Vataparampil, a senior member of the Division of Population Sciences at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. I think an important thing to know is that just because you have an HPV infection doesn't necessarily mean you're going to develop an HPV-related disease like cervical cancer, anal cancer, or genital warts. For most people, they're able to clear the HPV infection and go on about their day without any problems, but there is those subset of infections that, for whatever reason, stick around and may lead to health problems down the road. Government figures show that by age 24, 45% of women in the United States have had HPV. Most will never know it. Yet HPV is the cause of about 70% of all cervical cancer, and the virus doesn't discriminate based on gender either. We're learning much more that HPV is responsible for the vast majority of cancers that impact both men and women, including anal cancer. The vast majority of anal cancers are caused by HPV infection. Uh, About half of penile cancer, slightly more than half of penile cancers, and um, one that's really received a lot of attention lately are are the growing rates of what we call oropharyngeal cancer. Sometimes it's referred to as head and neck cancer. And while there's about 60% that are caused by HPV and 40% that are not caused by HPV, the group caused by HPV is the most rapidly growing of the oropharyngeal or head and neck cancers. So that, again, is a cancer that actually disproportionately can affect men. And that's the group that we see who are really kind of bearing the burden of that HPV-related cancer. What's particularly troublesome is that those cancers are much more difficult to treat than the same cancers when not caused by HPV. And it is in males where that has been increasing most dramatically. So now pretty much there is probably two cancers in females for every one cancer in men. The men are catching up quickly. Many doctors say cervical cancer should be non-existent in the United States. The pap test developed in the 1940s can identify cervical cells in a precancerous state when they can be easily removed and never progress to cancer. Still, about 4,000 women in the United States die of cervical cancer each year. Dr. Leah Smith is a postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University. Certainly since cervical cancer screening has been introduced, we've seen major declines in the risk of cervical cancer. But of course, there is a portion of the population um, that are still not undergoing pap smears for whatever reasons. And often it has to do with access, sometimes knowledge about the issue, education, those kinds of things. PAP testing is really a good example in the United States of how we've gotten close to population-based coverage of the test. So you'll see in most health surveys that kind of look at the status of what's going on with cancer screenings in the country that rates of testing across all racial, ethnic groups, minority groups is over 80%. But there are those subset of women that don't engage in cervical cancer screening. And, you know, it's the usual kinds of reasons that we think about. So things like access to care, lack of knowledge or awareness of how important this is. And this is still a very, very important group to reach. The failure to reach those women, as well as the increasing number of other HPV-related cancers, is leading many public health experts to push for more use of the HPV vaccine, which was introduced in 2006. 
The vaccine was originally recommended for preteen girls due to its ability to prevent cervical cancer. But now boys are also included in the guidelines. The way that the guidelines are currently indicated, every adolescent between the ages of 11 and 12, potentially starting as young as age 9 and up to age 26 for females or up to age 21 for males, should be receiving a recommendation for vaccination. So in that case, in our study where we asked providers, do you always recommend vaccination? And we asked by age group, what we saw is that the rates were far lower than what we would have hoped to see, which is that 100% of folks are saying, yes, I recommend it all the time. Veta Parampil's survey found that for boys age 11 to 17, only 13% of doctors and other health care providers recommend vaccination. And for girls? About 40% of providers, physicians, always recommended vaccine for girls ages 11 to 12, 55 for 13 to 17, and then 52% for 18 to 26. So again, only half the providers are reporting that they always recommend the vaccine. And because this is a vaccine that's really intended for everyone, not a select group of people, but every child that's within that age range, boys and girls, these are really rates that speak to that we have a lot of work to do to get those vaccination rates up. As it is, only 38 percent of girls and 14 percent of boys completed the HPV vaccination series in 2013, the latest year for statistics. That's far short of the 80 percent goal of federal officials by the year 2020. That's really concerning. At the moment, probably about one in 400 girls that a pediatrician or family practitioner sees in their practice is going to develop an HPV-associated malignancy, and it's about one in 700 or so boys. That's a lot, a lot of kids. Almost every practice is going to have several are going to get this. And the fact that the take of this vaccine is under 50 percent means that a large number of each of these birth cohorts every year, 4 million kids per year born in the United States of America, at the moment half of those kids are going to go on and be unprotected. And that's really a shame. The real issue is the missed opportunity and, in particular, the missed personal attestations on the part of pediatricians and family practitioners to say this is a vaccine that's very important, that's not optional. But why have so few parents had their children vaccinated with what's really a cancer vaccine? Well, first of all, some people think it's simply unnecessary, at least if women are keeping up with their pap tests. And males don't get cervical cancer at all. But Willoughby says that's antiquated thinking. If you're still thinking of this in an old-fashioned way as being an anti-cervical cancer vaccine, then there's no reason for the boys to get it. The boys get it because there's also this big risk of oropharyngeal cancers, cancers of the uh, mouth and throat. And then the other problem, which is a public health consideration, is that the boys give it to girls. And if only half the girls are getting it, then at some point you got to say, well, we got to give it to the boys so that they don't give the HPV to the girls. And that consideration also figured in. And all these considerations would go away uh, and be much simpler if people would get the vaccine at the same rate that they get other vaccines, which is up in the high 80% range. First of all, it would be almost game over for many of these cancers. We wouldn't have to have these discussions about girls versus boys. However, Smith says the biggest factor in keeping HPV vaccination rates low is probably the age when the vaccine is recommended to be given. So this is a preventive vaccine. So it's meant to be given before an individual ever becomes infected with HPV. And as we know, HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. And so the goal is really to administer this vaccine before the onset of sexual activity so that the probability that the individual has been infected or come into contact with HPV is still low. So when the vaccine first came out, for example, it was highly recommended for young women aged 9 to 14 years. So really in those young preteen ages when their probability of sexual behavior is still low. The age for the vaccine was chosen to correspond to ages pretty much 9 to 12. And that is a time when most but not all children have not initiated sexual activity of any form, including kissing. And therefore, it's the perfect time to vaccinate against the virus. Once you've acquired the infection, the vaccine doesn't help at all. So it needs to be done then. However, giving preteens a vaccine for a sexually transmitted disease seems to a lot of people like giving a license to be promiscuous, a license they'd rather not give. I think that's 
been a common concern, not just with the HPV vaccine, but with other sexual health-related interventions. We hear the same sort of debate with respect to, for example, rule-based condom programs or sexual health education programs. And so there's always this concern that by giving individuals knowledge about sexual health that it might be given as sort of a green light to become sexually active. So it's really not surprising that this concern has come up again with the HPV vaccine. However, Vataparampil cites a recent study involving more than a quarter million girls that shoots down that concern. The study was done by Smith and Dr. Linda Levesque, also of Queen's University. Now we have the data and the studies that show that, in fact, that is not the case and that vaccinated teens are no more likely to participate in high risk or any sort of sexual behaviors compared to their unvaccinated counterparts. So I think if parents or providers are concerned about sending that message, that doesn't seem to be the message that the adolescents are receiving. And we now have some really good data to support. That. Cost concerns and insurance hangups often prevent vaccination in the United States, but Vataparampil says some measures we could take are free. For example, public health officials have to steer the discussion of the HPV vaccine away from its prevention of a sexually transmitted disease. Instead, she says, call it a cancer vaccine. I think that's really where every expert and I think the successful vaccinators have really come to a point of consensus is that we need to emphasize the cancer prevention benefits of this vaccine and take it out of the realm of sexually transmitted infections, implying high-risk behaviors, etc., but really having a message that resonates with parents of, If there were a vaccine to prevent cancer in your child down the road, would you vaccinate your child? I think that's a message that parents understand that they would respond to and providers give the information in such a way that it really points to those benefits. However, if vaccination rates start to substantially climb, it might change who it makes sense to vaccinate. Levesque says maybe then we can stop vaccinating boys. The cost effectiveness studies that have been done for boys in the Canadian context indicate that it's most likely not cost effective to vaccinate boys if the use of the vaccine is in the range of approximately 80 percent for girls. And the presumption there is that in a heterosexual couple, if the girls are not carrying the virus by virtue of being vaccinated, then they're not passing it on. And with time, the viral load circulating will become very small to non-existent. So that's the principle behind any vaccine. However, while public health officials are trying to boost immunization rates, which vaccine will they recommend? Late last year, the FDA approved a new vaccine that covers nine HPV viruses, rather than the four major viruses covered by the current vaccine. It's the kind of uncertainty they don't need if they're trying to keep the message to parents simple and understandable. What they need to know is this. HPV causes thousands of cancer deaths in the United States each year, and in the future those tragedies could become completely preventable if kids are given the vaccine. I'm Reed Pence. Tests that can save lives from cancer are now available at little or no cost thanks to the health care law known as the Affordable Care Act. Tests for colon cancer and cervical cancer can prevent the disease altogether, and tests for breast cancer can detect the disease early when it's most treatable. These tests are now available at little or no cost, so don't let concerns keep you from getting tested for cancer. Let this be the year you and your family get tests that can prevent cancer or detect it early when it's most treatable. Talk to your doctor or other medical professional to learn more about the best cancer testing options for you and your family. Now you have options. It's your choice. For more information about how the health care law can help people with cancer and their families, contact your American Cancer Society at 1-800-227-2345. That's 1-800-227-2345. GEICO Motorcycle presents Reflections from the Road. Let me tell you, the road is a much more relaxing place since I switched to GEICO Motorcycle Insurance and started saving money. With that taken care of, now I can think about deep, important things. Like how come it's a pair of pants when there's only one of them? A real brain teaser. But hey, at least saving money with GEICO Motorcycle is as easy as pie. What does that mean, anyway? GEICO Motorcycle Insurance. See how much you could save. 
Lose the winter blues and warm up with hot flooring deals from Lumber Liquidators. Thinking about hardwood? Consider bamboo. We've got the number one brand and we'll help you get it for less. Like Strand Bamboo. It's twice as hard as oak and for a limited time, it's only $1.99. Why pay as much as $4.99 for bamboo at other stores? We've got deals on over 70 styles from an incredible $1.79. Plus, pre-finished hardwood, laminate, and more for less than half what you'll pay somewhere else. And 18 months special financing. Now is the time to warm up your home with new floors. So visit LumberLiquidators.com to find a store near you.